My name is Steve Schmitz, and I'm connected with the Town of Western Historical Society. Um, my talk today is going to be entitled Revival Revivalism and Educational Reform, Its Roots in Oneida County. I should mention at the outset that I also have a paper on the topic, um, brought about 10 copies. Uh, I could also send a PDF form to anyone who wanted to, to get it over uh, their email. I'm going to introduce you to three, I think, quite remarkable men who have strong connections with Oneida County and from Oneida County made national uh, reputations for themselves in their fields. Charles Grandison Finney was the most prominent evangelist of the era. Um, we all remember, I'm sure, the Reverend Billy Graham. Well, Charles Finney was the Billy Graham of the 19th century. George Washington Gale, connected with Westernville and Oneida County. Uh, George Gale, from his farm in Westernville, created an educational reform movement called the Manual Labor Movement. We'll talk about that uh, in detail later. Culminating in establishing from nothing a college on the prairies of Illinois, which is called Knox College. Theodore Dwight Weld um, was um, mostly known in his later career for his abolitionism, but he was closely tied to Oneida County and to Charles Finney and George Gale. We're going to do this in the form of taking a journey with them throughout their paths and their careers. We'll start in Adams, New York. Finney and Gale met in Adams. Finney found religion in Adams his so-called road to Damascus. We're going to come to Westernville, where in 1825, an evangelical tornado hit the village. We'll then move to Rome and Utica. We'll get a sampling of Finney's meteoric rise to uh, fame uh, in those two cities. In Oneida County and then in New Lebanon, which is near the Massachusetts border, we're going to hear the critics of Finney and his co-revivalist approaches to their preaching. We'll talk about the burned over district, central and western New York, where there's no fuel left to burn, and we'll explain that. One example of hundreds of revivals conducted by Charles Finney was in Rochester, and it's perhaps the most widely written upon and certainly well-known examples of how his revivalism could transform a town. From Rochester, we'll go to New York City. We'll meet the Tappan brothers, Arthur and Louis Tappan, two wealthy businessmen who were well known for their philanthropy and close associates with both Finney and Weld. We're going to go to Cincinnati, Ohio. We're actually going from uh, Whitestown. Oneida County to, to Cincinnati, and we'll explain how that occurred. It's called Oneida Moved West. I see my daughter from North Carolina is on the Zoom call. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks for joining it. We're going to move from Cincinnati to Oberlin, Ohio, to the Oberlin College, where you'll hear about the so-called Lane Rebels. Then in part two, we're going to go back to Westernville, and we're going to visit George Gale's manual labor farm. From there, we'll go to Whitestown, where we'll visit the Oneida Institute of Science and Industry, which Gale founded. And we'll end up in Galesburg, Illinois, the college on the prairie that Gale was the founder of. Here's the ideas we'll touch upon in our presentation. And I should say in advance, we're going to have to be very superficial about this. There are thousands and thousands of pages written about these concepts, but it's important at least to mention them. The Second Great Awakening, which was religion and religiosity in the mid-19th century. The New Haven theology, which was an evolution of the classic Calvinist doctrine. The New Measures, that's the term that describes the practices, the techniques, the approaches that Finney and other revivalists were using. We'll talk about the impact, connect the dots here, of New Haven theology, the revivals on the social reforms that were proliferating in the mid-19th century. 
We're going to have to talk about abolition. In particular, we'll talk about immediatism, which meant the immediate, unconditional emancipation of slaves, no strings attached, no compensation for slave owners, and a corollary, which is colonization, which stipulated that once the slaves are freed, they should be repatriated to Africa or the Caribbean, the thought being that the two races could not live together in America. As repugnant as that is today, that was a very uh, widely held concept in the 18th century. To do these two concepts, we're going to refer to the debates on them that happened in Whitestown at the United Institute and at the Lane Seminary. We'll end up talking about the manual labor movement. We'll explain what that is. We'll talk about uh, George Gale's farm all the way through to Knox College in Illinois. Now, I said we're going to start in Adams, New York, but really not. I'd like to start in Westernville um, to give you a flavor for uh, the impact that Charles Finney had um, uh, doing his revivals in a community. In 1825, uh, an evangelical tornado hit the village. And it happened this way. George Gale had moved, resettled from Adams, New York to Westernville to his farm. And one day he was taking a, a trip from Westernville to Rome and he spotted a buggy coming in the other direction. And he said to his wife, why that's Charles Finney. Um, we believe that he's, the Lord has sent, is sending him here to help us. Finney, or rather Gale, was not the called preacher at the Westernville Church, but he did preach there on occasion, and he had a very dim view of the state of religion in the village at that time. He said the moral condition of this town is always dark, but now it's unusually so. So he said to Finney, he said, Charles, there's a prayer meeting tonight at the church. Um, would you come? I think they could use your attention. Finney agreed. He went to the prayer meeting. They asked him to preach, and he said, well, no, I would like to hear your prayers first, and then I'll respond. So they prayed. When they got done, they asked Finney to comment, and he said in very vigorous, aggressive tones, your prayers are an abomination. They're a mockery of God. They didn't like this. In fact, he said later that at first I observed that they all looked angry. Some said that they were near to getting up and going out. But he kept on in this vein until the principal elder cried out, Brother Finney, it is all true. This was the signal for a general breaking down, a more thorough breaking down confession I have seldom witnessed. Now, I'd like to jump on a time machine and move away for a second from our metaphorical tornado to an actual tornado. This is the results of the tornado of July 2021. The picture on the left is the morning of July 9th. The picture on the right is early in December of 2021. Uh -huh. um, I'd also like to say at this juncture to give the thanks of the community and the congregation for the marvelous outpouring of support that we got to enable our restoration to occur. We're back in the sanctuary. We're back in business. Um, our pastor, Donna Schoenwender, is in the room today. Hi, Donna. I know that she wouldn't mind if I mentioned Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. <laughs> Come and look for yourself. Quite remarkable recovery. All right, let's go back to Westernville then, back to 1825. This started the so-called Western revivals. He preached in Westernville for 12 weeks. I preached three times on the Sabbath. God came down with great power on the people. It was manifest to everybody that the work of grace had begun. One of Finney's techniques that he used throughout his career was to make home visits to do personal conversions of people in their homes. And let me give you an example of that. This is interesting to me because this is my home on Main Street in Westernville. Uh, Finney made a visit to express his uh, revivalism to the Brayton family. The part of the house you see in the picture is built in 1812. The part in the back that you can't see was built in 1794. So it's an afternoon in 1825. There's a knock on the door, 
the lady of the house, Mrs. Brayton, opens the door, and there she sees Reverend Charles Finney. Ah, Mrs. Brayton, how lovely to see you. You know, I'm here to talk further with your daughters about the state of their immortal souls. Now, this is a picture, a portrait, the first one of Susan Brayton. She was not the subject that day. I think at this point she was about 11 years old. But it's a lovely portrait, and I wanted to put it in there. I just think it's beautiful. He was there to talk to Sarah Brayton, uh, her older sister, and Cynthia Brayton. Um, Cynthia uh, was later married to the noted engineer uh, Charles, uh, John B. Jervis, and sadly she died in childbirth a few years hence. So Finney's there to try to convert these two young ladies to uh, his message. So what happened? How did it work? Well, he recalled the conversions of the sisters uh, later in his memoirs, and he spent two pages describing the event. I, I'm going to summarize it much more briefly than that to let you know how it turned out. I called on Mrs. Brayton, who had a large family of unconverted children. The eldest daughter, Sarah, had been manifestly regarded by the family as almost perfect. I found the opportunity to enter into conversation with her, and by God's help, she was brought under powerful conviction for sin. She broke thoroughly down and came out into the kingdom as beautiful a convert as perhaps I have ever seen. Now, we were expecting Cynthia every day to come out a bright convert, but for some reason she lingered. Mr. Finney, I'm losing my conviction, she said. Mrs. Brayton heard the, this comment and was so shocked that she groaned aloud and fell prostrate to the floor. She was unable to rise, and she struggled and groaned out, groaned out her prayers. As soon as this occurred, the Spirit of God came upon Cynthia afresh. She fell upon her knees, and before she arose, she broke down and became as thorough a convert as Sarah was. So here are two uh, converts, two sisters. By the end of Finney's revivals in Western, there were said to be 140 converts. Well, let's back up, as I promised, and go back to Adams, New York. George Gale was the pastor of the Adams Presbyterian Church. Charles Finney had moved to uh, Adams to study law. He was going to be a lawyer. He described himself at that time as being a skeptic on religion. I was almost as ignorant of religion as a heathen. He went to Gale's services, and he wasn't impressed. He found Gale's preaching to be dull and meaningless, he could see no connection between the message and the lives of the people who attended. But they got together in Gale's study, frequently, to talk about religion. While well, Finney remained a skeptic, challenging and arguing with Gale, and at one point he said, if you have nothing better to support your doctrine, I must remain an infidel. But he worried. He worried about the state of his soul. He said, intellectually, I understand the teachings of the Bible, but emotionally, I feel nothing. One October day in a walk in the woods by himself, he had a powerful personal conversion experience. He writes this, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. He abandoned his pursuit of the law. He became an ordained minister. He started a series of small revivals in Jefferson and St. Lawrence counties before his rival, as we've talked about, in Westernville. From Westernville, the word was out. This is a man you need to hear. People were coming from all around to visit his preaching in Westernville. So he was invited to go to Rome. He went to the First Presbyterian Church, Reverend Moses Gillette's church, and he turned that, uh, that town upside down as well. It is said that the meetings in Rome continued for five or six weeks to a day, the meeting house being filled to capacity. Young people in particular drove from miles around to heed the exhortations of the evangelist. Mechanics and merchant shops were closed so that all could attend the meetings. Religion was the principal conversation on the street, in the stores, and even taverns. In 
He moved from Rome to Utica, Reverend Aiken's first Presbyterian church. Similar outcomes, 500 converts in a very short time. One of the converts was Theodore Weld. Now, Weld, at this point, very young man, he was very skeptical and uninterested in Finney's message. But his aunt was. And she insisted and persisted and cajoled Theodore Weld to attend a worship service. Theodore, you must hear this amazing preacher and his message. Well, Auntie, I don't know that I really want to, but okay, if you insist. She was clever. She took him to church sat him in the center of a pew, sat her lady friends on either side of him, and when he got fidgety and looked like he was going to leave, the ladies bowed their heads to the backs of the pews in front to pray, and he was trapped. Now he said he actually wasn't converted at this session, but he was later because Charles Finney knew of this bright, promising young man, and he pursued him. And in the course of personal meetings like the kind I described, uh, Weld became converted to Finney's message, and they, as I said, they remained closely associated throughout their lives. I find particularly poignant uh, an episode, an incident of preaching at a factory in New York Mills. Finney was asked if we would come and dress the workers, and at the conclusion of the work day, they assembled, and he said this about that event. The word I could see took a powerful effect, especially among the young people who worked in the factory. The next morning I went to the factory and saw a great deal of agitation among those who were busy at their work. I approached a young woman and looked solemnly at her when she was quite overcome, burst into tears. The impression caught on almost like powder and soon nearly all the room were in tears. So these are among the many, many revivals that he held in the area at the time. Now, what happens inevitably when someone rises to quick and notable success? Criticism. Critics emerged in Oneida County, and and in a second we'll describe beyond that, who were not happy with what they were seeing in the revivals, revivalists like Finney. They critiqued his new measures. They said this, they're wild and they're extravagant in the extreme. His voice is too penetrating. His hypnotic eyes are very disturbing. It's ostentation. It's noise. He calls men hard names. Ministers and lay, laymen are irritated by his provoking directness. Two of the principal critics in Oneida County were William Weeks from Paris and Ephraim Taylor from Trenton, who published their diatribes against Finney and his techniques. His Oneida County allies, though, rallied to his defense. More than 3,000, they said, have become reconciled to God. They published a document, there it is, in which each of the pastors gave testimonials to the positive impact that Finney's revivals were having um, in, their, in their congregations. Um, I put in the appendix to the paper, I put abstracted these comments. I think it's quite interesting to see how delighted they were with the results of the revivals. More serious opposition, though, soon emerged. New Englanders, looking at the West, were not quite pleased with what they were seeing. Lyman Beecher led a kind of coalition of New Englanders who challenged the new members in the revivals. I think they were a bit concerned that this was a challenge to their traditional methods of pastoring that uh, would diminish their importance. So they had a conference. They got together in uh, New Lebanon, New uh, New York. They they met for almost a week. Among their criticisms of the new measures, that the revivalists stimulate excessive zeal and unseemliness, that very soon after a conversion, many of the uh, converted revert backslide to their old ways. The bitterest topic, I find this interesting, was that the revivalists were encouraging women to pray openly in mixed gender meetings. Discussion all week long, motions, resolutions, votes, arguments, debates, but in the end, by the end, Finney and his allies emerged victorious. His reputation soared. His biographer says, his revival spiritually resonated with the social, nope, that's not the one, 
By any measure, he must be counted the real victor at New Lebanon. He had to be accounted one of the leaders in the campaign for awakening America. Finney moves on, and others, there were other revivalists as well, as well of course. They moved on throughout the so-called burned over district. This is the area of central and western New York where revivals proliferated in the 30s and 40s. It was said to be so heavily evangelized, there's no fuel, the unconverted, left to burn to convert. So what was it about his style that was so powerful and effective? Well, as I said, he used the so-called new measures of revivals, no more droning, reading from script, dull messages. These revivals were emotional, they were visceral, they were intense, they were demanding, they were challenging. Finney himself is described as charismatic, a fierce countenance, penetrating eyes, hypnotic. He electrified his listeners. One witness said he moved like a caged lion across the platform, he savagely tore at public composure and lethargy. Finney used the so-called anxious bench. Now, the anxious bench was a seat down front where if you were on the brink of conversion, you came and sat, and you got the personal attention of the evangelist. We'll talk for a second, and all, all too brief a second, about some of the evolving theology and its link with social reforms of the era. This was the so-called Second Great Awakening. There was a First Great Awakening in the 18th century. This was a shift away, this explosion of religiosity was a shift away from the rationalism, the deism, the Unitarianism, and so forth of the Enlightenment. Very different in tone emotionally than what had preceded. Started about 1800, went to the 1850s. During this era, there were a number of new religious sects that were formed. Mormons, Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, John Humphrey Noyes, the Nina Community. Now, theology was evolving at the same time. There was a new group of theologists who were discarding the old Calvinist doctrine. Now, you probably know that doctrine said that man, humans, are so blemished by the original sin of Adam that nothing that they can do in their lives will guarantee their salvation, that God, in some mysterious way, would determine who was to be saved. The new theologists said, well, wait a minute. We think that through man's individual will, he or she can make decisions, can make choices, can take actions that will better ensure uh, the chance of salvation. Now, why this is important? Think about the fact that now in this era of many, many social reforms, the idea that we can make through our actions and decisions, we can make moral uplift a reality. One, one person wrote, Finney's revivals spiritually resonated with the social trend that problems have solutions and that human determination and moral vision exist for creating a better society. I see a link here. There's much, much more about these um, social reform movements, but I see a link here between the two. So let's use one particular well-known revival to kind of illustrate how effective Finney could be. In 1830, Rochester was a thriving canal town. The Erie Canal had created a boom in the, in the town. Finney, uh, there, there was a lot of turmoil as well in the town. There was fights between the Presbyterian churches. Uh, drunkenness and intemperance was a great problem. Uh, there was a Sabbatarian movement that sought to ban all activities, even transportation on Sundays. The town was in a bit of, a, of turmoil. Finney arrived in October of 1830. He preached till March of 1831. Um, it said he preached 98 times, including having personal, converse, personal conversions of the manner that we spoke. Midway through his time there, he decided that he would turn his attention to temperance. Rochester was known as a drinking town. Um, a lot of drunkenness among the working class in particular, riotous behavior, it was a problem. Finney said, let's stop our regular message for a bit and let's turn to exclusively to temperance. So to do this, he invited Theodore Weld, already known for his oratory skills, 
to come from Oneida to Rochester to lecture on temperance. He was a hit. One report was he gave a lecture that throbbed with crackling vitality and dynamic impact. It is said he was so effective that by the end of his lectures that many merchants who stored it, or who held alcohol in the inventories poured them in the Erie Canal. There were many, many requests for Finney to preach. There's, there's 90 letters said to have survived of people beseeching Finney to come and to preach in their, in their, in their area. One of which was from, interesting, Milton Brayton, who was one of the Brayton family, who wrote to Weld and said, you must have Finney return to Western. We cannot live without him. And he did, but much later. We're going to move to New York City. Now remember that Finney's been on the road. This is a very taxing uh, schedule of revivals. It's kind of getting worn out. The Tappan brothers are Arthur and Louis Tappan, two extremely wealthy businessmen and extremely fervent philanthropists. They knew Finney. They'd heard him preach. They knew Weld, very, very strongly supportive of both, and they invited Finney to come to New York City and have a settled pastorate. Charles, you don't need to be on the road so much. We will offer you a venue where you can preach every Sunday or whenever you want, and to thousands of people. They provided the Chapel Street Theater, which is a venue that held 2,500 people. Finney accepted saw it as maybe a time to slow down a little bit and not be so much on the road. As I suggested, the Tappan brothers were ardent, ardent abolitionists of the most radical kind, immediatists for sure. They also were supporters of the manual labor education movement. They'd become familiar with this, and we'll talk a little bit more later, with manual labor from the Oneida Institute, where Lewis Tappan's sons had enrolled and where, through the sons, the senior Tappans met uh, Theodore Weld. They formed the Society for Promoting Manual Labor in Literary Institutions, and they employed Theodore Weld to be its general agent. Weld traveled the country. He went thousands of miles assessing the state of manual labor, looking for opportunities for more expansion of manual labor institu uh, 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 academic institutions. One of the things that the Tappans asked Well to do was find a spot for a national cemetery in the West. The West was seen as needing this much more than the East, where we might locate and train theologians to minister in the West. So we did. Came back to the Tappans and said, Arthur and Lewis, we don't have to build a seminary. I found one. It's the Lane Seminary in Cincinnati. Now, Lane had been formed a few years before, wasn't doing particularly well. A couple problems. First, it had almost no students or faculty. Secondly, it really was thought they needed a prominent, prestigious president to draw attention to, to itself. Theodore Wells said, I've got a solution, I think, to both problems. He said, I believe I can attract 20 students or more from the Oneida Institute in Whitestown to come to Lane Seminary and enroll. They did. It's reported that they bought a flat boat for $6 and they took the canals and the rivers and whatnot to Pittsburgh where they took a steamer to Cincinnati to enroll at Lane. Well said, I think I could interest Charles Finney in being your president. Well, he made the overture to Finney who declined and instead they recruited our old friend, now Finney's friend, Lyman Beecher. Lane became known as Oneida Moved West. Now the Lane students were fervently anti-slavery. Back at, in, in Whitestown, they had had a series of debates on abolition, on the proper position for abolition. And when they got to Lane, there is Lane, by the way. I don't think that's quite an early, early time, but there it is. When they got to Lane, Wells said, let's continue these debates. This is really important, and let's make them public. So over a series of 18 days, they had public debates on the issues, the right approach to take for abolitionism. These are called the Lane debates. Well, the trustees of Lane, this made them very nervous. 
Remember that Cincinnati at the time was more pro-slavery in sentiment than pro-abolition. The trustees, many of them businessmen, had ties and associations with the slave economy of the South. So they did not like this notion of debating so vigorously and publicly abolition. They issued an edict, you students, no more debates, no more discussion of abolition. Don't even discuss it in the dining hall across from each other. We, want, we will brook no more discussion of abolition coming from Lane Seminary. Well, the Lane students, pretty rebellious bunch anyway, they rebelled and became known as the Lane rebels. They quit. They left. They resigned. They started a seminary, uh, in an informal seminary in a small town near Cincinnati, trying to figure out, well, where do we go next? Well, where they went next was Oberlin College. Oberlin College, also in Ohio, was fairly new at the time and was struggling. It was a manual labor college, but the students weren't raising enough revenue to support the college's finances. The president of Oberlin College was a man named John J. Shepard. Shepard was a Finneyite by his training and avocation or interest, and he knew of the Lane students, the Lane rebels. And he said, I think if we attracted these students to our school, it would give us the attention that we need to prosper even further. So he went to Weld and said, I think you might be interested in enrolling in our college. Well said, well, maybe, perhaps, but there's a few terms and conditions that you must meet before we are to enroll. It's interesting to think of the power that Weld had to actually negotiate with the college president what they must do for these students to agree to enroll. And there were several terms and conditions. One was that the students should have a voice in the selection of faculty. The second was that the college must guarantee complete academic freedom for the students and the faculty. And the third, maybe the most important, was that Oberlin College must agree to admit black students along with whites. Well said, I think there's a couple more things I could bring to the table here. One is I believe I could interest Charles Finney, the great revivalist, so well known, to accept a chair in theology. Charles Finney did. Well said, also, I have the ear of Arthur and Lewis Tappan, and I believe if I make a recommendation, they will provide funding to your college. And they did. Later, as we were talking earlier, Garrett Smith also provided funding for Oberlin College. Finney became the Oberlin, took the chair in theology, became the Oberlin president, which he held for many years. But he wanted to continue his revivals in, in between his, his teaching jobs, and he did. And we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of where he went from there. And there's Oberlin. There's our Oberlin College. Little Oberlin. All right. As I said, we're going to now devote some time um, to George Gale and his manual labor plan. George had settled in Westernville. He moved from Adams. He had a chronic health problems, which prevented him from preaching regularly. So he thought that if he bought or leased a farm and engaged in farming, it would be good for his physical health. He was aware, George was, of the impact of Finney's revivals on young men who were interested in becoming ministers, following in Finney's footsteps. And he had an idea. He was aware of the so-called manual labor movement. Now, that originated in Europe, wasn't much used in America. Um, George kind of hints that he dreamt it up. He really didn't, but he is credited with the advance of manual labor in educational institutions across the country. And it worked this way, very straightforward. In exchange for tuition, books, lodging, the students would perform labor on the farm, in the shops, whatever, and the earnings from that labor would offset the cost of their education. Then he had an idea, and here's how I described it in a little imaginary scenario that I wrote. You're a young man living in the town of Western in 1827. 
You're working on your family's farm on Quaker Hill. You don't mind farming, but your passion is for an education. So you might enter the ministry. You've been inspired by the oratory of the great preacher Charles Finney. But education costs money, and you have none. Higher education is for the elite, and you are decidedly not among the elite. You confide your desire to Reverend George Gale, who has preached at the local church, and Gale says, why, young man, I have just the thing for you. Come to my farm just outside the village and join several other scholars who, in exchange for their labor on the farm, are being educated in theology and the classics. The product of your labor will cover the cost of your board, books, and tuition. So he brought seven young men to his farm, including our Theodore Weld, and it began to attract attention. So much so that he thought, we can make this more prosperous and larger if we have a bigger, uh, bigger way to do this. And he approached the United Presbytery for funding to establish a permanent institution in, in the manual labor mode. They looked all around in central and western New York, and they ended up settling on uh, the Hugh White Farm in Whitestown, which they purchased, and then they built uh, the institution uh, from there. It started out quite successful. At one point, they had uh, 500 applicants for admission for the few slots that they had. Um, it was drawing a lot of attention, including from Arthur and Lewis Tappan. Lewis's sons enrolled at Whitestown, that's how they met Theodore Weld. It went along well for a few years. George Gale said, this is not really my cup of tea. It was the principal. He said, this is really not my cup of tea. I have other plans in mind. So he went to the trustees of the United Institute and said, you need to find a replacement. I need to move on to other ventures. The trustees appointed Beriah Green, and there's a whole story behind that, which we won't go into today, but in its existing format, the institute did not exist for that many more years after. But George Gale, in fact, was the founder. And there it is. Gale had big ideas. He was passionate about manual labor. He wrote in 1836 the so-called circular and plan for establishing a new manual labor college in the West to be called Prairie College. He recruited subscribers, he raised funds, they looked for land in Indiana and Michigan before settling on Illinois. They purchased acres of the old military tract in Knox County and they put together a plan to build from nothing a new college. Gale gathered the subscribers and the folks interested together and said, folks, the time has come for you to make a commitment. Will you move west so that we may establish this theological training, manual training seminary in Illinois? Well, 46 families and individuals agreed to pull up stakes from central New York and other places and move to Knox County, Illinois, a place they'd never seen, they'd never been there. There was nothing there. It was going to be built by them. They were also going to establish a village uh, adjacent to the college called Galesburg, um, and they made the epic move west. Now, I'm impressed by this. The college, Knox College historian in 1937 writes this. Thereupon began the epic move west. They sold their farms, packed their household goods, hitched their workhorses to farm wagons, and got ready for the toilsome journey to Illinois. Every few months, a train of covered wagons of parties of 20 to 40 left the Mohawk Valley and settled down to the steady plod plod of 20 miles a day over roads that were bad and became worse as they got further west. Some of them basically walked alongside their wagons. The journey was hard, but not especially dangerous except to health. Two children were buried by the wayside, one woman died, and three men succumbed to the malaria that lurked in the lowlands along the western rivers. If you, got, if you went out the, of the door of this building today and got in your car and drove to Knox College 
in Illinois would take you 13 hours and 44 minutes. I looked it up. You have to be impressed by the commitment, the faith, the zeal with which these families abandoned everything they knew and went to a place that, of which they knew nothing. College did well in the beginning. Uh, Gail was appointed a trustee. Uh, he was appointed a professor of moral philosophy. Uh, the school grew, its enrollment grew. The village of Galesburg, by 1845, had 70 structures. Um, in 1841, the first freshman class was admitted. Um, school was doing pretty well. In fact, so well known that by 1858, it was designated a site for one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in which it was reported 16,000 to 18,000 people attended. Well, as sometimes happens, troubles erupts. Gale fell out of favor with the trustees and the administration. The issue was religion. Gale was pretty jealous of his Presbyterian religion and was resentful when other denominations tried to be involved in the control of the institution. So he resigned. There was the so-called Blanchard Wars. At that point, John Blanchard was the president of of uh, Knox College, and uh, there was a bitter fight between the two, charges and counter charges, and it was just lawsuits and the whole thing. It was ugly. Um, the students took sides and, on one side or the other, and it was a pretty dark time for the college. The college historian says that um, George Gale had the mind of a zealot on religion. And there is Knox College. Probably not the earliest year. That looks like a pretty well-advanced building, but that's what it was at some point. Okay, so let's just wrap this up. Finney continued teaching at Oberlin and writing. He left a big body of religious writings behind, continued his revivals around the country, even to the point of going to England and Scotland, um, returned to Westernville in 1855, as he did to other places he had previously been, uh, to check on how his friends were doing. Well continued to be extraordinarily prominent in anti-slavery activism, perhaps one of the most prominent um, uh, in the country. He wrote a, a kind of a compendium of descriptions of slavery called Slavery As It Is, um, said to have been perhaps the most influential abolitionist document publication until the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Gale stayed at uh, Knox. He retained his professorship. He remained alienated from the college trustees until um, his death in 1861. In 1861, after his death, a trustee made a motion at a meeting to memorialize George Gale, and it was tabled without action. What, about, what was the assessment of, of, of Gale? Again, the college historian writes this. Gale had the mind of a zealot who was narrow and intolerant in religion, but gracious in social intercourse, a dreamer, somewhat visionary, but lacked the qualities as a leader, gifted with powers of persuasion. He was not an educator, not interested in any real sense of the, of the young men, except as possible instruments for the spread of the gospel. He founded the college to create ministers, not to educate youth. I think that's a little harsh. Um, when you think about uh, Gail's accomplishments, uh, starting a manual labor institution on a farm in Westernville, expanding that to the Anadi Institute of Science and Industry, uh, determining that no, my idea must go thread even further, formulating plans, getting subscribers, raising funds, and building a college on the prairie in Illinois, thousands of miles away, uh, that remains today. In fact, Oberlin College, as you know, and Knox College are even today considered among the finest liberal arts colleges in the country. So starts in Oneida County. We should be proud of it. Uh, these are remarkable men who did remarkable things, and I hope you learned a little bit about uh, these famous figures in our county's history. Uh, that concludes my talk. I hope it didn't go too long. If there's questions, I'll try to answer them. As I said, I do have copies of the paper.
if you don't get one or you want one, there's a PDF I could send out to uh, anyone who's interested in, uh, in, the paper goes into obviously a lot more detail than I was able to do today. Thank you. Thank you.